All right, so let's get started. Um, today is going to be a bit of onboarding, honestly. Like we're going to walk through expectations and you know goals for this course. Uh, we'll take kind of a brief view of the materials, just getting getting that cleared away, uh, so you all know what we're working with. Um, we're going to talk about uh, study hall and mentoring, which are a couple of services that our team provides for students aiming for the DSI. We're going to talk about the technical interview as well. Um, and a little bit about mindset and, you know, kind of a brief tour of some of the tools that we might use. Um, Learn, which is our learning platform. Replit, which is, uh, you know, an online coding environment, one of many. Um, it's one that we have uh, had students, you know, use, play around with for quite a while. So it's, uh, it's pretty familiar to many of you. Um, Google Colabs, which might be a little less familiar, but um, these are sort of stand-ins for having a local coding environment, which, you know, we'll talk about getting, you know, having you get set up in uh, somewhere around the beginning of week three. You know, we'll probably dedicate uh, a study hall just for that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about Slack etiquette. We'll actually talk about that a couple of times. Um, so just to be transparent here, uh, I am looking at slides in, um, in Markdown format. These are slides that are available on our GitHub repo for the class, which I will post in the Slack right now. So um, right here, I'll just start off there in case you want to grab these slides and follow along. Um, if you navigate to slides, which is right, this folder at the top and go into welcome.md, that's actually what I'm looking at over here. Although here I'm looking at it in VS code, which, which is a text editor. It's the text editor, editor that we recommend, uh, or actually that you'll be required to use in the DSI. So I'll be using this primarily, uh, for code and also uh, for showing the slides, uh, as, as you can see here. Okay. So, uh, quick overview. Um, this is a five week course. Classes are Monday through Thursday, 6 to 8 p.m., Saturday, 11 to either 1 or 1 30 p.m. Um, we might, we might adjust this. We might make it 1 15, um, or we might keep it at 1. Uh, the issue being that there are, you know, there's a holiday, right? And we want to make up that holiday. So, um, I'll, I'll likely put together a quick poll and give that poll to you guys, um, you know, tomorrow or the day after asking, you know, would you prefer to have an extra day tacked on, right? The Monday after, uh, our last Saturday class, or would you rather extend Saturday by, uh, 15 minutes or 30 minutes, depending on what we need to do to, to, you know, get to that 50 hours that we're looking at for the course. Um, so expect that, uh, I'll, I'll probably post it tomorrow or on, uh, Thursday, depending on, uh, cause I need to talk to my team about that as well. So, um, yeah, five weeks, uh, essentially two hours, Monday through Thursday, two hours on Saturday. And, uh, in this slide, I have a list of all of our team members. Um, Jess Ball is our team admin. So if you have, you know, questions about, uh, getting a refund for the course or something like that. If, if you, you know, you're a weekend, you're like, well, this isn't for me. Um, you would reach out, you'd probably actually reach out to me and then I would reach out to Jess Paul, but you can reach out to her direct, directly. Um, and then the technical people on our team are listed here. Tovio, Lance, Remy, Devin, and Clark. Um, I'm Tovio. Clark is uh, the other instructor for this course. Clark will primarily be instructing in Python. I'll primarily be instructing in the kind of math stats portion, which is also heavy, heavy on the Python. There's only one pen and paper day when we get down to it. But um, yeah, you uh, you shouldn't hesitate to reach out to us with questions. Um, you know, uh, we're all available via Slack in our current Slack organization. Okay, so um, in terms of the documents, I did just show these, but let me let me just show you this. This is a this is our GitHub repository. If you're not familiar with GitHub yet, um, you know, today we're going to have it as a homework assignment. Sign up for a GitHub account. Um, it's not gonna hurt anything. 
you're going to use GitHub in the long run as the space that contains your professional work, right? Um, or your hobby work. It can be, uh, it can act as a portfolio. It also acts as a repository for things that you're developing or developing with other people. Um, it's part of a version control system called Git. GitHub is kind of the de facto standard uh, for online code repositories, um, pretty heavily used. There are other ones, but GitHub is by far the most popular. Um, and just to give you a sense of the structure here, the, the landing file in this is this readme.md. And this has our daily schedule. Uh, and let's just scan through this really fast. Um, I have a list of important links here, including the link, uh, the Zoom link. Um, if you click on this initialize uh, section, you know, this learn materials, you can find the password in the initialize section. If you're in this room, I'm assuming you found the password. So I'm not too worried about that. Uh, there's a link to the premium prep recordings, which I'll talk about, about a little bit more. We record these, these classes and we post them on YouTube in a playlist. So you can go back and watch them. They, we don't take them down. They'll be up there indefinitely. And you're welcome to go back and watch uh, videos in other playlists for our, from prior versions of this course. Um, the course does change a little bit each iteration. We're trying to constantly update it and make it relevant for the students we have in front of us. Um, but you, you know, if you want to work ahead and you really enjoy that lecture format, there are videos from the prior uh, the prior iterations of Premium Prep. Okay, so uh, what else is here? There are a bunch of helpful resources here, and um, you know, feel free to look through these. There's if you're using Chrome, there's an extension that will render uh, render math formulas on GitHub, which can be very helpful. Um, I'm going to recommend that you install that extension if you're using Chrome. Uh, and there's also you know kind of a list of supplemental materials uh, that we like, you know, like. Uh, JB Statistics, which uh, if you haven't looked at that before, it has uh, some great foundational and, and theoretical materials to go through. Uh, and I, I'm not going to, you know, go through all of these. I just want to point out that, the, that they are there. Uh, we also uh, have a couple things related to Galvanize here, like uh, we have a podcast called Tech Pivot and um, uh, on Spotify, on Apple. And uh, this is well, I, I think really this should be in the resources, but um, you know, there's a, a great site if you want to learn more about computer science, uh, algorithms, and things like that. If you want a visual representation of a bunch of algorithms, uh, Visual Go is is a nice site. Uh, but you know, the main, the heart and soul of this document is this day by day schedule, right? So here's today. Uh, both Clark and I are, are on this call today. And the slide decks that we're looking at are Welcome to Premium Prep and Introduction to Python. Um, we, we are gonna probably focus mostly on this Welcome to Premium Prep and we'll maybe take a tiny dent into Introduction to Python um, you know, when I hand over to Clark. Uh, so you know, uh, what, we might, what we often do is we get as far as we can get in the slides and we might adjust the schedule to reflect that, right? So you know, here we've got uh, introduction to Python on, uh, you know, today. And then we have a continuation of introduction to Python tomorrow because our expectation is that we won't actually get through that today. Um, if you have questions, feel free to post them in the Slack. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, depending on the structure of the lecture, we'll either address those questions right away if it's something we can address right away, uh, or we'll kind of time box it a little bit later, right? Um, like open the floor for questions at some point. So I'm probably gonna move through things a little bit, uh, you know, just so that we're, you know, steady going forward. And then I'll answer questions as they come in. Uh, yeah, and so, you know, if you scan through this, uh, you know, let me just go back to uh, this Wednesday, uh, tomorrow's class, we've got slide decks and, um, you know, often we'll have a homework assignment posted the homework is in our learn platform, which I'm going to demonstrate in a little bit. Um, we don't have any external homework at this point, aside from what's in learn and aside from, you know, hey, go register for Code Wars or go register for, um, for Git, you know, with GitHub. 
uh, you know, so you have those tools at hand. Um, and uh, the recordings, uh, once we get the recording uploaded, we update it here, right? So recording, it says to be added, lecture two. This will be updated with a link to that video on YouTube when we get there. Uh, are the questions supposed to be posted here or in the main DS Premium Prep chat? Uh, post them, uh, please post them in the thread where, where you're asking the question right now. That's perfect. And in general, that's where we want people, we, we want to sort of box every, um, every class into the relative thread. It'll keep the, uh, the, it'll keep the Slack channel really clean. Um, and that's generally how we'll run this. Uh, unless, you know, outside of class, you have a question and then you would post it in the general, uh, the Slack channel generally, not in a thread. Okay. So that is our uh, course outline, um, you know, our premium prep docs, as it were. And uh, yeah, we want to think about this as our source of truth, right? This is where we put everything. And you can always reference back to that. Uh, at the end of the course, we are going to archive, you know, this outline. Um, but, you know, the new outline will be up there. If you want to find, if you want to go back to the outline, we'll post a link to that, to the archived outline after this course ends. So um, we persist that indefinitely. Uh, okay. So a uh, little bit of lecture etiquette. Um, we prefer that you have your camera on. That's for engagement. You know, that's, um, if you don't feel comfortable having your camera on, that's absolutely fine as well. Um, it's not a requirement. Uh, set yourself to mute by default. Um, if you don't set yourself to mute, um, as a host, what I have to do is stop sharing my screen and then mute you and then start sharing again, which is um, fine. It's fine. You know, uh, it, it's easy to miss that you haven't muted your microphone. Uh, but when you come into the channel, you should be set to mute by default. Right. So um, just keep in mind, uh, you know, if if I'm like, hey, I think someone's mic is on, uh, just check your mic really quick to make sure it's not on. Um, and yeah, and uh, limit your questions to the lecture thread, like I said, uh, in uh, just a few minutes ago. Or uh, at specified times, um, we might say, hey, if you have a question, feel free to come off mute and ask it. Uh, that's something that is fine to do when we say that, OK? Uh, also, at the end of class, we'll, we'll stop recording. We'll say, hey, feel free to come off mute and ask any questions or post them in the Slack. Uh, you might notice I'm wearing headphones. Uh, part of the reason I'm doing that is, uh, you know, in case somebody does come off mute and ask a question, we're not recording that uh, to the video that we're posting on YouTube. OK. Um, I already said this, uh, but we'll be hosting, you know, our recordings on our YouTube channel. And there is an empty playlist right here. Everything will go up here, okay? And that's just, uh, you know, that's where you'll reference it. And yeah, that, you know, we'll also update them on the course outline. Uh, and starting last round, uh, we started posting, you know, the, the links to the lecture in the uh, general channel as well. So that, you know, um, there's a lot of inroads to finding the lecture recordings. All right. Um, we want to, you know, maintain privacy, anonymity. So, uh, you know, please don't say your name if you or names of other students if you come off mute. Um, you know, if you do that, basically, I'm going to open, <laughs> I'm going to open up the video in uh, a video editing program and clip out, you know, like, go through and find those and clip them out, um, uh, which is a, a bit tedious. And I'm, I'll do that, but I prefer not to. I prefer to just take the recording, throw it, throw it up online. I think that's um, much more convenient for me. But um, yeah, also, if, you know, if we say your name at some point on accident, uh, we're, we're definitely going to try not to. But if we do, you know, send a quick DM or just say, hey, you said that, that person's name. Um, and then, you know, we can make a quick note of it and go back and edit that out as well. Okay. All right. So let's think about goals here. Um, what are the goals of this course? So uh, we want to get diverse students to a baseline level to pass the technical interview. That is really the goal of this course. 
And as such, it's maybe not like other Python courses or statistics courses that you may have seen. We are targeting the technical interview very specifically. We want you to have the set of requisite skills that we test in order to you know, determine if you have the capacity at that time to be successful in the DSI, okay? So, you know, we'll talk more about the technical interview in a little bit, um, but that's really what this course is oriented around. You know, it is, it is a, you know, fairly complete course in terms of giving you requisite Python skills, but there are things that we leave out that you don't need to know in order to go into the DSI, okay? Uh, both in terms of Python and in terms of the statistics materials that we'll cover. Uh, we cover those statistic materials, statistics materials very much in through the lens of Python, okay? Uh, like I said, there's only one pen and paper day, uh, and that's probably, you know, probably be half a lecture where we cover conditional probability. That doesn't lend itself very well to, you know, writing code, so we do that pen and paper. But uh, pretty much every other concept we will approach through code, right? And, you know, that is going to bring us to uh, ideas around the technical interview, which I'll talk about very shortly. Um, something to keep in mind, if you are not new to Python, if you're not new to the statistic concepts or Python, um, and you find the materials very elementary, if, if, that, if you're a student in that camp, please reach out to us. Uh, what we'll probably do is, you know, try to set you up with a technical interview much sooner than later. And we'll also provide you other materials to study, right? We can gauge what you need to learn um, or what would be beneficial for you to learn if you're a more advanced student, right? If you're going into a specific field within data science or if there's, you know, some weakness around some topic, some subtopic, then, you know, we can give you things to work on. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind. If you are ahead, we can give you more materials. If you uh, find the things too simple, we can give you more materials. Um, on the other side of that, if you're really struggling with basic concepts, we do provide mentoring, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Okay. So, uh, you know, periodically during lecture, and this is just to kind of get you primed for this idea, um, we're going to have a breakout and uh, we'll, we usually have it, you know, specifically timed. We'll say, okay, we've got this five minute breakout or three minute breakout or something like that. And we'll ask you a question, you know, uh, you have that time to, to work on an answer and post it in the Slack. So this is kind of like a, you know, quick trial one of that. Um, what are your goals for this course? And uh, please post your response in the Slack thread uh, for today's class. So um, what I usually do is I have a timer in my uh, terminal. And so I'll just set my timer to three minutes and I'm gonna go on mute, go ahead and type something up about your goals for this course. So I'm noticing a lot of people posting in the main channel. What I'm gonna do is uh, copy all of those messages and put them in the Slack thread. Uh, in general, please post in the Slack thread. Um, if you go to the original place where it says, here's our Zoom link for today's class, uh, where it says 30 replies or 31 replies, it's changing as people reply, you can click on that and then post in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy everything in the main channel over to the Slack thread.
Um, hey everybody, it's me, Clark. Uh, I'm still noticing people posting in the main channel body. Uh, please try to keep your comments in the thread, not in the main channel. Um, I'm trying to go through and, and catch up with that, but uh, it's going faster than I can catch up with. So if you're typing in the main thread, um, please uh, move your comment, just copy paste it over to the uh, main channel. Yeah, there's there's always, uh, I think, a little bit of um, a learning curve on on, uh, on Slack. And, you know, uh, it's something that we'll get more and more used to as we go forward. Um, but yeah, Clark, uh, thanks for cleaning those up. Um, all right, uh, I think I caught up with all the posts that were in the main channel and Clark is going to... Um, I'm going to go delete delete the ones that are in the main channel. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so, uh, you know, there's no right answer here. Uh, so, sorry, no wrong answer here. Um, so, you know, that said, we do have some expectations. Um, and these expectations are, you know, can be a little bit flexible, uh, depending on what they are. So the primary expectation we have is that you're working toward completion of the challenges in LEARN. Now, what is LEARN? Um, I might as well show this now. So LEARN is our learning platform, right? Uh, probably most of you have seen this already because of the initialized section. Uh, notice this is dated July 6th to August 9th. Um, if you are signed up for the basic prep, then um, you have two cohorts on LEARN. You've got the basic prep and then you've got the premium prep uh, that is shown here. We really will encourage you to work in the premium prep that is shown. It's the, you know, the materials in it are not different from the basic prep, but it's easier for us to, you know, uh, track your progress, right? I go through and I look at this uh, every day. I, you know, notice, have you been working on something? Have you not? Um, you know, and uh, generally we keep tabs, you know, for, for our own purposes uh, in reaching out to you to give assistance we keep tabs by uh, looking at this specific cohort. So please work within the cohort. Um, yeah, so we expect you to be uh, working on the challenges in the learn materials. Uh, what is a challenge? Let me just find one here. So I'm clicking on scalar types here in introduction to Python. And let's just look at where it says the integer type. If I scroll down, notice that there are challenges. There's challenge one, challenge two, and challenge three. Uh, some of these are coding challenges. Other ones are, um, you know, you answer a multiple choice question or you provide a numeric answer or something like that. Um, yeah, so we expect you to work on those. Uh, we expect you to attend lecture um, or watch the lecture recordings, right? That's, uh, there are things that we cover in much more detail than are covered in the uh, basic prep or in, in the materials on learn, actually. Um, and there are other things in the materials on learn that we don't cover as much. Uh, our reasoning being that we are guiding you very specifically toward the technical interview, okay? Um, so, you know, we expect you to watch these lectures. If you go back and watch them on high speed, if you're a more advanced student, you know, of course, that, that's totally fine. Um, if you can't make every lecture, uh, we take it attendance, but we don't take it in any punitive way. We take it for our own records, um, you know, in order to, you know, discuss uh, what we're doing right, what we're, you know, uh, you know, how students utilize our course in general. Um, so we, we expect you to work on the homeworks. Um, we understand that sometimes it takes longer to complete the homework assignments that we give than, you know, than a day or something like that. Um, and uh, we also expect you to ask questions when you're stuck. And a good rule of thumb is if you're stuck on something for 10 minutes and you don't see it going anywhere, um, ask a question in the, in the channel. You can either ask in the premium prep channel that we're in, or you can ask in basic prep. Those are both great places to ask questions when you're stuck. Um, if you are answering a question that another student has asked, um, we're going to really ask that you don't give them the answer that you 
provide them a breadcrumb trail, right, to, to the answer, right? Give them questions that lead them in the right direction, uh, give them hints, that kind of thing. But uh, please don't answer questions outright. Um, it kind of like takes away the learning experience from the student. And, you know, the biggest expectation we have is that you practice a lot, okay? Um, you can practice a, a bit in lecture and you can learn in lecture. But if you think about this, uh, the, the analogy I like to, to use for this is you can watch Bob Ross, right? You can watch Bob Ross paint, you know, like trees and nature and things like that. But unless you are painting, right? Unless you practice painting, you're not going to become a painter. You can't watch someone paint to become a painter. This is very true of, you know, uh, of programming. Programming is a creative act and you need to practice. So we have a lot of materials to practice. There are some other resources that will point you at to practice as well. Okay, so what does premium prep cover? Just as, as a summation, basic Python proficiency, basic probability and statistics concepts, and the ability to express those within Python. Uh, this is all geared toward the technical interview. Uh, so uh, let's look back over at Learn just one more time and consider the sections that are relevant for this course. Obviously, the initialize and onboarding section, which uh, most of you have looked at already. There's introduction to Python, intermediate Python, and uh, introduction to probability and statistics. These are the primary things that this course will cover. There are other sections, however. Um, there are some extra practice problems. Um, you know, these might be good places if you're studying up on dictionaries. Dictionaries are really important in the technical interview. There is a set of dictionary problems that you can work on. There are weekly challenge problems as well. Uh, those come out weekly, right? And uh, there will be a link posted in the weekly challenge uh, channel on this Slack organization. There's also this preparing for the technical interview section. Um, we are going to try to grow this a little bit at a time. Um, for now, there is a set of videos regarding the technical interview that um, you know, I'll link all of you to shortly. And uh, there's also, this, this is going to become important, although we won't cover it specifically in class. Um, you're going to, at some point, want to set up a development environment so that you can run Python locally. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have already done this. Um, some of you, uh, I'm sure, have not, right? And we're going to give you tools to use in the meantime before you set up your local environment, but it is going to be important to set up your local environment before very long. Um, what I usually suggest is at the beginning of the third week, trying to get that set up. Um, you know, simply having a, you know, the ability to run Python in your terminal is going to be very powerful. Uh, and then we've got this further studies section. And I'm gonna point this out because this is parallel uh, pretty much exactly the same as, I should say, the materials that are in the pre-course for the DSI. Once you pass the technical interview, uh, there you're, you're not done. You need to complete a pre-course before day, well, before the Wednesday before day one of the DSI, okay? Um, if you get started on these further studies materials right after you pass your technical interview and, you know, get them done, that progress gets imported into the pre-course. And you know, then you just have a little bit to wrap up. The pre-course takes between 40 and 60 hours, right? So um, the sooner you get that done, the better. However, I, I'm gonna recommend that you don't get started on any of these further studies until after you pass the technical interview, okay? Um, you know, we don't test you on anything in here uh, in the technical interview. So there's no reason to do these until after you pass that. Okay. Um, so those are the, the sections of our materials on learn. Let me um, jump over here. Okay, great. Um, we already covered that. Uh, there, there are often um, little bugs in our materials, uh, mostly copy error things, right? Um, most of the people on our team who developed this curriculum are not, uh, you know, are not writers uh, first. We're, 
we're programmers, we're developers, we're data scientists, and we make grammatical errors and we make other kinds of errors as well. If you notice something like that, tell us, you know, um, absolutely, please tell us. It, it's very beneficial for us. We do, we do our best to catch everything. You know, we, we have a, a copy cycle, right? We go through and edit everything, but it's easy to miss things. So you can post any bugs you, you find in our channel called bugs. Uh, okay. So the individual lectures, um, like I said, they're two hours uh, or a little bit longer than two hours, depending um, on the cohort. Like we'll probably have an extended Saturday lecture. And we're generally going to cover a topic for some fairly brief amount of time. You know, uh, I say here five to 15 minutes, and then we'll have a breakout or a couple breakouts. And then we'll repeat that. Um, depending on the specific lecture, uh, there are times where I will lecture and especially on a specific set of concepts where I'm coding a lot, where you're going to be watching me code and I'll be taking my code, pasting it in, and then you'll utilize that code. Sometimes um, I'll lecture for maybe 20 minutes or half an hour in those cases, uh, because it does get a little more conceptual. Um, so in general, what we're going to do is briefly lecture, have a couple breakouts, briefly lecture, have a couple breakouts and continually do that. Um, we have quite question breaks uh, from time to time, depending on the lecture. Uh, but more generally, you know, we'll answer questions more in real time in Slack. Like when I see the question come up, I'm going to think, oh, okay, can I can I answer this right now? If I can, I will. Um, either that, or I'll pause at some point and be like, okay, I'm gonna look at the questions and answer them. Uh, we also, as I said before, at the end of class, um, you know, we open up the floor and we answer questions. Uh, and we'll stay on anywhere from five minutes to 20 minutes to answer those residual questions. If there are questions that we um, that, we're, that we don't answer within that time frame, um, often we'll set up a direct mentoring session. We'll say, okay, hey, do you want to meet up tomorrow to talk about this? If you're really confused about the concept, then we can do that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we find that to be an effective way to cover a concept that uh, maybe you're not understanding in that moment within the kind of lecture format. Okay, great. And uh, yeah, so we also have study halls. These happen Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time, right? 4 p.m. Mountain, 5 p.m. Central, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern. And that's about an hour and a half long. Uh, generally, we'll go an hour and a half. Sometimes we'll go a little bit longer. And um, that's just, uh, we stream live on YouTube. And we have a channel called Study Hall where you can post questions to us in the thread. Um, you know, we'll have uh, anywhere from, you know, eight or nine people to 20, 30 people, uh, depending on the study hall. And sometimes study hall is us just, you know, maybe there aren't that many questions that day and, you know, we'll take it upon ourselves. I'll cover some kind of concept, like, you know, uh, some kind of random sampling approach or Clark will cover, um, you know, error checking. You know, you know there, there are different things we might cover in study hall that uh, maybe are extended further from the course materials that we're covering um, in lecture, uh, but we also just take questions. And the best study halls are, I, I think, when all of our students are asking questions like, hey, I'm stuck on this problem. Can we work through it? And then that's what we do, right? So uh, that's here for, for your benefit. Um, there are times where we cancel. Uh, either due to, well, holidays, obviously, but uh, sometimes our bandwidth becomes, you know, constricted to some degree, especially toward the end of um, the end of each of our quarters where we're performing a lot of interviews, right? And we might just not have time. Um, so in that last couple of weeks before the DSI start dates or the interview cutoffs, uh, we might not have as many study halls, just a fair warning, but we'll let you know. We'll, we'll post any cancellations in the Slack threads. All right, uh, mentoring. I've mentioned mentoring a couple of times. Um, yeah, that's a big part of what we do. So we might meet up with you for 15 minutes or 30 minutes to cover a concept. Um, there are times where people uh, really want to get a sense of, if, of their readiness for the technical interview. And in those cases, we might um, run through, run you through 
a set of problems, right? Or we might give you a mock interview. And that's to, you know, at the end of that, we might say, okay, well, you did pretty good, but maybe you need to work more on dictionaries and uh, list manipulation. Or, you know, you seem like you're in a good spot, but, you know, maybe brush up on discrete distributions a little bit. Uh, so we can give you that kind of mock interview. We can um, coach you through a specific concept where you're struggling. And that, like I said, that's a big part of what we do. So um, we'll, you know, um, we, we can't mentor everyone all the time. <laughs> this is also contingent on bandwidth, uh, just like study hall. Uh, so what, what we'll do, we'll either set something up with you directly if we have that time and that, that space in our calendar, or we'll put you into a queue where people from our team will, will grab you in order of the request. Um, we also send out a couple emails uh, as we go, you know, uh, especially uh, surveys, you know, like, hey, what can we improve in the course? Um, things like that. And, you know, a lot of the time people will respond to those emails with, hey, can I set up some mentoring, right? Um, the other thing we do is we look at percent completion. And there are points in your completion where we might say, hey, it looks like you're about ready for the technical interview. Um, do you want to meet up with one of us one on one? And we can gauge your readiness and get you on track to do that. So uh, yeah, I guess just to sum up, mentoring is a big part of what we do. So um, you know, don't hesitate to reach out in that regard. Um, let's see. I see a few questions still in the main channel. Let me. Uh... I'm on it. You're on it. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, I guess those aren't actually questions. Those are more comments. Okay, great. Um, so deferring. What do I mean by deferring? Uh, there are people who were in the last premium prep court, cohort or an earlier cohort who are in this cohort. The model that we have here is is essentially you uh, you know you join premium prep, and we are here to try to get you to the finish line or you know get you past the technical interview. If you do that this round, great. If you need to take premium prep again or a third time, um, that's fine. And uh, you know, if that's if that's what you need to get there, we are, we definitely encourage that, and we we have that opening. Um, generally, you you can message me to request deferrals for the next round. Uh, you know, we'll we'll continually ask ask you uh, as we go forward, especially in in the last couple of weeks. We'll say, hey, if you want to defer, you know. Um, you can either go fill out this form or direct message me or, or Clark and we'll get you added to the next round or a future round. Um, yeah, and you know, some people, they, they do that because they're falling behind. Uh, other people, you know, might have some other issue that they encounter, right? That prevents them from regularly coming to class or continuing their studies at that time and they'll defer to a later cohort and that is fine. Uh, absolutely no cost for that deferral. Um, okay, so uh, for supplemental materials, I already mentioned this, but if you find yourself uh, ahead, reach out. We can give you more to work on. Um, one thing that you can always do, and I highly recommend doing this, is you can register for a Code Wars account and start working on problems on Code Wars. Uh, if you're a beginner, beginner, maybe you're not ready yet to set up an account. You have to solve a very simple problem to set up that account. And maybe you need a little bit of Python under your belt to do that. Um, but if you know if you know how to write a function, you can go to Code Wars and you can work on eight, uh, level eight problems. Um, they're called eight uh, Caillou or Q. Not sure how to pronounce that, honestly, but um, those are the easiest. And that's where I suggest starting. Um, it's, I, I'm going to recommend that you start your admissions process, you know, uh, as soon as you can. And the reason is that we are an education team, uh, and we are not, even though I've read all the enrollment materials and things like that, so I can try to answer questions, um, I, I'm not great at answering those questions. I can tell you a lot about Python. I can tell you a lot about stats. I can help you forward with those things. But in terms of the actual enrollment process, 
there are questions where I'm going to say, hey, uh, go talk with your enrollment advisor about that. I'm, I'm not totally sure on it. Um, and so to have access to an enrollment advisor, uh, you do need to complete an application for admission. Um, so that I posted the link for that. The sooner you do that, uh, you know, the sooner you have access to that enrollment advisor and, uh, you know, either by email or, or phone um, or Zoom, you know, they, they tend to meet with people quite a bit. Okay. All right. So I've been talking about this thing called the technical interview, and uh, I want to maybe just jump into what this is. Um, it's 45 minutes long, and we are going to test you on your mainly your ability to code Python in relation to statistical concepts. Um, we're going to cover a lot in this course that directly gears you toward the types of problems that you're going to be answering in the technical interview. Okay, uh, there are a couple things here to notice. Uh, remember that expectations unit in learn, right? Uh, where is it? Uh, it's called preparing for the technical interview. So this unit um, has just, you know, a set of a set of things. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's, it's got everything. Most questions that you you're going to have uh, are answered here, uh, but also feel free to reach out if you have questions on the technical interview. Um, there is a playlist that is linked here. Um, it's uh, unfortunately uh, YouTube changed their playlist embeds and I think they're broken. So we just have a direct link to it here. Um, I'll stop this before it plays. Uh, but it's a, this is a series of lectures. And one of the things that we say is that if you can watch, if you watch through these, and you feel like you could code any of this uh, if prompted, then you are uh, more than likely going to pass the technical interview and you should just book your interview. Um, this is also a good learning resource. It's, you know, it, it's also that. So um, especially when you have a solid foundation in the Python and SAS materials, I highly recommend going and watching this. And, um, you know, there are, are a couple questions in one or another of the technical interviews that are uh, directly coded within these videos. So um, I think they're, they're helpful, mostly in terms of the process, the kind of analytic process that we're going to test you on in the technical interview. Okay. So let's see. Um, so about us, about people on our team, we are not gatekeepers. That is not why we're here. Uh, we want to facilitate you getting to the baseline of skill that we need to see for you to be successful in the DSI. And that really is why we're here. That's our goal. Um, we're going to do our best to get you there. Um, one of the things that uh, you'll probably hear me say this a couple times, we don't need you to be the best programmer. We don't need you to uh, be amazing at everything. What we need is for you to meet our minimum bar. And with that in mind, um, you know, we can give you a sense of where you're at. If, if you're communicating with us, we can say, okay, it looks like you're ready for the TI or you're not quite ready for the TI, work on this. Um, so please utilize us as a resource. Uh, we're, our goal is to get you into the DSI. Um, there are some, uh, you know, just in terms of mindset, um, I'm sure some of you have, uh, have encountered this idea of a growth versus fixed mindset. Um, the way that I'm going to sum this up is really, if you're new to this, you're going to find likely find some things to be fairly frustrating. And, um, you know, you're going to get error messages, and uh, you're going to not know how to do some things. That's very normal. Okay. Um, and what you're going to start discovering is that errors are your friends. Right? You're going to find, oh, okay, I got this error. Let me look at it. That's telling me what's wrong with my code. It's telling me what I need to fix or telling me how I'm going to get to that uh, working function that I'm trying to write. Um, there are, uh, you know, it's okay to be frustrated. Um, I'm just going to recommend that you channel that frustration into, uh, you know, sort of like, um, I don't know how many of you do Sudoku or those similar kinds of puzzles. There are, you know, what keeps me interested in those kinds of puzzles is that I make mistakes and I can't figure it out, right? 
Uh, I think coding is very much like that. Coding is this space where you're given a challenge that you don't know how to do and you start solving it. And in the process of solving it, you have epiphanies and you learn a way to do something. And that contributes to future things, right? There's positive transfer into future endeavors, future functions that you write. Um, but it is sort of like playing a bunch of tiny games. And uh, if you develop this idea of like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out, I'm trying to solve this, uh, instead of like, oh no, I can't do this. If you, if you develop that enthusiasm toward getting to solutions and figuring things out, it's going to help you a lot. Um, the sooner you can kind of build your mentality around that, the better, um, you know, but of course I understand people, people are going to get frustrated. That's also very understandable, um, especially if you're new to programming or uh, this sort of technical field. Uh, this is, let's see. Okay. Uh, the, a thing that I'm going to talk about uh, from time to time, um, I'll maybe like, you know, wax philosophical about it here and there is, uh, you know, critical thought. Um, we live in a time where uh, critical thought is, I'm just going to say a precious commodity. And um, there, there is a lot of struggle around scientific and critical thought. Um, in your role as a data scientist, one of the amazing things that you get to do is, uh, is disappoint people in a way that is um, insightful and uh, grounding into the real world. And so part of how you do that is you look at a problem someone gives to you, like your boss gives you um, a bunch of uh, a bunch of their kids' notes uh, from school, right? And they're like, hey, predict the stock market based on this. And you're like, uh, that's impossible, actually. I know you think that's possible, but it's not. This is not, you know, this is not magical. Um, you may not understand it, but it's not magical. Uh, I cannot take this and turn it into this. Um, at other times, people will make, you know, sort of hyperbolic jumps in their reasoning. And as a data scientist, you kind of have to be that voice that says, I don't think that works that way. And here's why. So um, I'm going to point these things out uh, more, more likely on kind of a, you know, more granular mathematical way uh, uh, scale, right? But I am going to encourage um, getting kind of a head start here and there for your own uh, personal development on this uh, list of cognitive biases on Wikipedia, there's going to be a point where this kind of thing helps you a lot, okay? Um, you know, some minor study in that direction is going to be helpful. Um, but yeah, uh, you wanna be able to think critically about problems and you wanna be able to ask good questions. And to be able to do that, that takes a lot of development of critical thought. So I'm just putting this out there, uh, you know, and I'll touch on this here and there as we go forward. All right, so um, we looked at Learn already, so I'm not gonna cover that again. Uh, Learn is where all of your homeworks are, essentially, uh, all, all of our course materials, and you're going to work steadily through that. Um, not necessarily you know, starting at the beginning, working to the end or anything. Uh, you know, you're going to start with Intro to Python. You're going to, uh, you know, at some point in Intro to Python, I'm going to teach a basic stats class, and then you'll be looking at Intro to Stats, and you're going to be kind of jumping back and forth from then on. Um, but uh, that's where all of our, you know, actual, um, let's say, textbook materials are. There are a couple options. If you don't have a local coding environment, there are a couple options you can utilize in order to write code, okay? One of those is Replit. This is the one that we've been mostly depending on. Uh, so I'm signed into Replit here and I can uh, click on this blue box up here. And this is going to say, okay, well, you wanna create a new REPL um, in what language? And I wanna create it in Python, obviously, because that's what we're looking, on, uh, looking at. It's going to give it a name and I'm gonna click on create REPL. This is going to give me an environment where I can write code, okay? Um, so if you don't have a local coding environment, you can use a browser-based environment like I have here. 
So I'm just gonna write a quick function just to demonstrate this. Uh, one of the functions that we expect people to write early on is factorial. Uh, so this is just, you know, if I put in five, it'll be five times four times three times two times one. Um, and this is going, I, you don't need to be able to write this right now. Okay. Uh, but I just want to demonstrate that this is a working coding environment. So I'm going to just say for every number in the range from one up until N, we're going to multiply this product by that number. And we can just return. Product. So if I call factorial and I have to print this, I call factorial on the number five, I would expect to see 120. Aha, n plus one, sorry, <laughs> one to n plus one because we want to include n. Uh, that's something you'll learn about very soon. So if I run this again, this is going to be uh, one times two times three times four times five, and we get 120. Okay, so uh, that's Replit. Um, we also have Google Colabs. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, not going to cover, cover Google Colabs right now. Uh, my reason being that I think REPL is a better place to start. It looks more like a classic text editor. Um, if you want to explore Google Colabs, by all means, please do. Uh, it's an amazing, it's a, ama it's an amazing thing uh, that's out there. It uses something called Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter Notebooks are heavily used in the data science community, um, but we're going to focus or I'm going to recommend that you use Replit or something similar to this, like a, a browser-based Python environment uh, that has like a, a run and you get to see the results. Um, I'm going to recommend that you use something like this because it's a lot like having a local editor, having a local text editor. So um, yeah, with that, we have a another quick breakout that uh, in this in this breakout, you're actually going to set up, just set up a quick Replit account um, if you don't already have one. So uh, let me put in a link to Replit. It's just repl.it. Actually, I think they they may have changed this URL, but this should still work. It should forward to the correct one. Um, and so you're going to create a Repl, and then you're going to print you're going to take this, print hello world. You're going to type that into the REPL and hit that play button. So what does that look like? Um, you know, I'll just something like this. I'm going to print hello world, and then I'm going to click this play button like so. And it should say hello world, and it does. OK? So uh, and then once you do that, paste the link to your REPL in the Slack thread. So notice this is here. Um, if I just copy, I'll just copy this URL directly. Um, and yeah, so once you get a working REPL that says hello world, go ahead and paste that into the Slack. So I'll set a timer for uh, four minutes and yeah, go for it.
All right. So yeah, uh, a ton of ruffles have been posted in the thread. And awesome. Yeah, so that seems pretty, pretty accessible. Um, it's a coding environment that's just there that you can utilize. Um, you know, I think I think uh, make sure when you post in the thread that you don't have it checked to also post in the channel. Um, uh, just pay attention to that uh, when you're posting in the thread. Okay. All right. So uh, if you're having any trouble, um, you know, setting up a REPL, uh, reach out to to Clark or I, uh, Clark or me. Um, actually, uh, we can we can address that at the end of class today. Um, when we stay on after for questions, um, we can probably walk through any, you know, any hangups, hiccups that you guys are having. Okay, so um, we got one more slide here. <laughs> and uh, so this is just reiterating something I've already talked about, uh, because it does tend to be pretty important. Um, you know, Slack etiquette, if you're asking a question uh, about a specific challenge on learn, which you will, ask those kinds of questions, you're going to get stuck on something on a challenge that you're trying to answer. Uh, please paste a link to that challenge, along with your question and try to have the question be clear, well formed, like, uh, I'm having trouble with this challenge. Um, you know, here's my code. Here's a link to the challenge. Um, I don't understand why this is happening. And then that gives us uh, space to answer your question directly. And uh, again, reply to people's questions using this kind of Socratic method uh, where you ask questions that lead them toward a solution or you ask uh, or you give hints toward a solution. Um, but try not to uh, try not to uh, give them the answer. Also uh, answer within the thread where they post the question. So very much like how we post our class, you know here's the link for today's Zoom uh, meeting. Um, you know, please ask questions in the thread below. Uh, you know, we try to, we're trying to keep these things, we're trying to keep the Slack channel clean by containing our threads, uh, you know, our, our topical threads. Um, also, uh, I know this is uh, still probably a little challenging for some people. Um, please keep your questions and responses in the Slack thread itself. Uh, you know, you'll get the hang of it. In, in the next couple of days, um, it's something that we'll be able to show you more and more. Uh, don't give people the answers. Uh, there used to be a bullet point on here. Um, don't attend class with your shirt off. Um, and that's because people have done that in the past. Uh, please don't do that. Um, yeah, I'm just saying that because it has happened. And um, yeah, so that's it for me. I'm gonna hand over to Clark and uh you know i uh but before i do that if you have any questions uh for me right now please post them in the thread um i'm not going to answer that question um because uh what we can't see we don't know about uh, i'll just say that um <laughs> uh yeah just so, as long as we can't see it yeah please. really as long as we really really can't see it please yes <laughs> Um, okay, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and post them in the Slack. Uh, if there are no questions, um, I'll, I'll just wait, you know, 30, 40 seconds, and I'll be handing over to Clark to get started on, um, yeah, kind of an intro to Python. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions and well, somebody's typing. Oh, uh, that's a really good question. Um, strategies for getting familiar with syntax. Uh, what are strategies for getting familiar with syntax? Um, this, is, this is one of my strategies. If I'm learning a new language and this probably isn't what anybody wants to hear, but um, if I understand what the code is doing and I'm having trouble with the syntax, one of the things I'll do is take functions that I'm familiar with, okay? Like, um, 
let's say factorial or uh, greatest common divisor or you know some other common simple algorithm. And I will type it over and over again. You know, um, what I what I like to do is make a flashcard for it uh, using a program called Anki. But you could do this um, you could do this just with paper flashcards. Uh, you know, write out the syntax um, and review it. And after a few days, that syntax will start to stick. Um, and I'm I'm not always a big fan of repetition in that way. I, I think that sort of rehearsal repetition is not always great. But for syntax, I think it's pretty effective. Um, honestly, the more you write code, uh, the more you look at your syntax errors, the better your syntax is going to get. Um, I think a lot of adjustment will happen in time with error with uh, looking at your errors. But in the beginning, with a new language, what I'll do, um, and maybe Clark can suggest something else. But what I'll tend to do is uh, just try to type the thing over and over again a few times until the syntax is kind of imprinted uh, better. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, you've completed intro and intermediate Python. Will this class help even with these completed? Uh, yes. Um, so you may be closer to the technical interview than um, maybe some of the other students who are newer to Python might be. Um, and in that case, what might make sense is for you to meet up with, uh, with one of us, like meet up with me, meet up with Clark, and we can gauge where you're at with your Python skills, right? Um, what I tend to suggest is doing Code Wars problems and building up your repetitions, right? Um, there's a point where uh, your ability to just creatively solve a problem is more there. And I think Code Wars is a good place to do that. Um, there are a number of statistical concepts. And if you feel, if, if your code is, if your coding skills are in a good spot, um, what we might do is just focus you in on the specific statistical concepts that are in the technical interview uh, to try to push you in that direction. So, um, you know, feel free to direct message me. Uh, I, prob I probably won't be able to reply until tomorrow, honestly, but um, I can get back to you and set up a mentoring session and we can gauge where you're at and focus your studies, if that makes sense, uh, or, you know, have you work on repetitions on code wars in the meantime. Um, in the first week or so, uh, it might be a whole lot of review, okay? Uh, stuff that you already know. So um, after the first week and a half, I would say you might be breaking new ground. Um, but I can't tell that without, you know, of course, meeting directly with you and, and getting a sense of that. Okay. All right. Um, with that, I'm going to hand over to Clark. Uh, I'm assuming you're going to uh, take a quick five-minute break, Clark. Um, awesome. And yeah, thanks so much. Uh, it's great to meet all of you. Um, I'll be back at the end of class uh, with Clark to stay on and answer questions at that point, too. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Clark. I'm your uh, primary Python instructor, and we're going to have a five minute break, and then we'll get into some Python stuff. So um, just hang out. We will reconvene at 16 after the hour. All right, cool. <clears throat> Welcome back, everybody. Uh, if you can hear my voice and you're still on break, uh, we're reconvening. Uh, so please, you know, uh, uh, Get, get ready and uh, turn your, your um, camera back on. I apologize for the big light in the background there. Um, I'm gonna be off camera, mostly just presenting my screen. And I'm maybe if I move my head like this, um, I just I just uh, rearranged the space for, for my office. And this is my first time teaching out of here and I'm realizing I, I've got that big light there. So I'm gonna have that, I'll, I'll try to have that fixed uh, for next time and get a light in front of me. Um, a couple things I want to go over before we get into the um, uh, material for today. Um, I'm going to try to go at a pretty leisurely clip and just we're going to take our time and get through the material, the Python material um, at a pretty steady pace. Um, so it, it may be common that we don't like finish um, the whole 
lesson for the day. Um, that's kind of to be expected where um, we've recently repaced re repaced the materials, meaning kind of slowed them down and we're um, doing them at a different pace. So th that process is still a little bit uh, still happening to some extent. So um, that's just something that you can expect if we don't make it through uh, a full day's schedule for what's slated that day, we will cover it the next day. Um, a couple things. I know some folks are having uh, issues with Slack. I'm, I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot or anything. Um, that's it's totally fine. I know Slack is kind of a uh, a small or medium sized monster, depending on <laughs> how you relate to it. Um, it does. There is a learning curve. Um, I'm not really <laughs> as as um, uptight as I might seem about uh, the the thread being perfect. I know that there's just gonna be a time, an adjustment time and everybody getting used to like pasting in the class thread. So if you paste out of the class thread, it's not a big deal. Um, I hope nobody takes it personally if I like deleted their message out of the main channel body. Um, it's just that one thing I noticed is when people, uh, one thing that really helps me feel like I'm, uh, we're really having a good class is when people are communicating, when people are asking questions, I get a sense that people are engaged. And I do see a lot of engagement. I do see a lot of questions happening. And I just want to make sure that everybody knows where to do that. Um, because if you're posting in the main channel body, I have Slack up on my phone, I just won't see it. So that's why I'm trying to get everything, you know, I'm, I'm going to kind of try to uh, push everything towards uh, being threaded as much as possible. And once people get in that rhythm, uh, then it can make for a really lively and fun and uh, useful class for everybody. So um, that's the only reasoning behind that. So um, if I end up deleting your message from the main channel body, don't take it personally. It's just uh, trying to get on the same page with that. And there's a learning curve. So uh, we've got five weeks. So we've got plenty of time to like uh, establish that and uh, get that going. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> Let's start off with, I wanna get a little temperature check and see where people are at. Let's just do a, and I'm gonna do breakouts like this and ask questions and you'll put your answers in Slack. Um, so I wanna get a sense of what people's experience level is roughly with Python. And you don't have to be too precise about this, but um, we're just gonna do one to three, um, one being, um, this is your first time ever attempting to code me, you know, like maybe you've been, uh, you know, in basic prep a little bit or a few weeks before this, but basically this is your, your first time learning a programming language. Um, two would be, um, you have some experience maybe in Python or another language, but you're not, you're not really comfortable in it. And maybe, maybe that experience comes from a while ago, maybe back, uh, in high school or in college, and you haven't really used that skill set since or developed it to the point where you're comfortable. And three would be that you're comfortable in Python or another language. So go ahead and just put that in Slack, a uh, one, two, or three in the thread, in the class thread for today. One being basically no experience, two being some experience, but you still have a lot of questions, and three being you have strong experience in Python or another programming language. Cool, great. Great, great. Okay, I'm seeing ones, I'm seeing some, we got a good number of twos in here. That's good. We got at least one three that I see. Would be 1.5 about JavaScript. All right, that's, I'll take a 1.5 on that. Cool, okay. That'll give me a sense of kind of where everybody's at. Um, and kind of how to pace the materials appropriately. We've got a good mix in here. Great, thank you. All right. All right, let me get the, let me get the material up and running here and we shall get started. Give me just one minute.
All right. Uh, give me a thumbs up in the thread if you can see my screen. You can see what I'm presenting. Good. Awesome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. Um, so this is my environment. This is the Atom text editor. Um, it's not VS Code. Uh, the reason I'm using Atom is what the, the kind of coding and features that we're uh, covering in this. Um, I'm not really going to be using advanced features uh, too much. And Atom is what I learned on and it's just my favorite little pet toy. Um, but it's um, essentially everything you see me doing in here, you're going to be able to do in Replit or um, VS Code. And I do recommend that you use VS Code specifically and not use Atom. Uh, if you're going to learn a text editor, um, learn VS Code. If you're just starting and you don't want to go through setting up a local environment yet, um, like Tovio mentioned, we recommend that you start by using Replit. It's a good like first uh, first editor environment, and it's easy because you just go in your browser and you can just code in there, uh, and that's a great place to start just learning problem solving for now. Um, so let's just jump into things here. So <clears throat> introduction to Python. So what is Python? Python is a general purpose programming language that can be used to develop web apps and software, write scripts and automate uh, operations within operating systems, operate robots and other technical machinery and much more. So um, I'm sure some of you are curious, some of you may be aware <laughs> of the, um, <laughs> the uh, there's sort of a, uh, a running uh, thing about how HTML, you may have heard like HTML, for example, is not a programming language. You may have heard of other languages that are considered or aren't considered quote unquote programming languages. Um, basically what we mean by that is a language that is, um, is Turing complete. If you don't know about Alan Turing or Turing machines, you can go look that up. It's very interesting. But what that essentially what that means is it's a language that is uh, capable of modeling um, complete algorithms. So we can. It's a system for doing sort of complete algorithmic modeling or complete in the terms of uh, Turing machines. So what that allows us to do is. Um, write code that executes under certain conditions, uh, repeat operations an arbitrary number of times, and work with data in different forms. And that's kind of the basis, uh, amongst a few other things, that, of what we think of as a complete programming language. So, um, what's meant by what what's meant by uh, general purpose is that Python isn't designed for a specific domain. You will hear about it in data science. It's it's strong in the data science domain, but it's not made for data science only. There's a lot of different domains that you'll see Python in, uh, which is really great because it's a uh, it's a really nice language to work in. Um, I my first language that I learned was JavaScript, uh, and I like there's a there's some things I really like about JavaScript, but um, in terms of like, just like the pleasantness of the, the syntax and the semantics of the language, uh, Python is a really nice language to work in. So um, it's nice that, you know, if you're learning it for data science, you know, you can do a lot of other things with it. Um, it's not just, you know, purpose built for one specific thing. So it's general purpose. Uh, Python for data science. So Python is one of many languages used in data science and machine learning. Uh, it's by far the most popular. Um, it's easy to learn, it's easy to read, it's easy to write. Uh, there's extensive scientific computing libraries and published academic works that use Python. So this last here, let me just kind of copy and paste this in. This last point here, um, let me comment these out. Uh, there's extensive scientific computing libraries. So this is what I think of as infrastructure, right? There's infrastructure. There's there are uh, large, well-known and well-maintained 
uh, sys uh, code bases that uh, you'll end up using like NumPy and SciPy and other things um, that are well established in the Python ecosystem. So people know that you know Python is has these tools, uh, and those tools are being maintained uh, by good maintainers and things like that. So there's a lot of infrastructure to support doing um, doing data science. Um, it's easy to learn. It's easy to read and write. By comparison to a lot of other languages, uh, if you've if you've tried to learn, say Java or C, uh, Python just has. It's safe to say a lower lift in terms of getting up and off the ground and running, and starting to be able to code in Python. Um, the 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 sort of easy, pretty syntax does come with some sacrifices. Um, Python is an interpreted language and something that's easy for us and looks nice for us to work with isn't necessarily something that's also easy or nice for the computer to work with. So um, there's some sacrifices made in terms of performance in order to make a language that is more pleasant to work in. Um, and I want to mention this because I want to I want to sort of point something out about performance. I've seen a lot of like when I when I ask for people's you know assessment of their own skill uh, one to three. I'm seeing a lot of ones and twos. And one thing that I notice, especially amongst beginners, is it's easy to over overestimate the importance of writing uh, efficient, uh, like highly optimized or very fast code. I'm not going to say that those things aren't important. And I actually enjoy those kind of optimization problems a lot. But um, it tends not to play as big a role as you might think it does. So Python is not the fastest language in the world. Um, but it doesn't need to be because it has some aspects of it, some of that infrastructure that I was talking about is very fast. So under the hood, it can do some things that are very powerful and very fast. Um, but it's um, not necessarily the fastest, but that's okay because a lot of times um, it just makes sense to have a language that's easy to work with and easy to maintain. You can, you can put together a team of people who have a, a light, nimble code base that is able to be flexible and maintainable um, easier by a you know wider array array of people. Cool. So a bit of a trade off, but that's okay. Um, another language that you'll hear about, but we're not going to get into, and I, I just want to mention this because uh, people will ask occasionally, um, is um, uh, another language that you hear about in data science is, is R, the R programming language. Um, R is sort of domain specific. It is meant to be a statistics um, processing language. It is technically a general purpose language, but it, it is purpose built for doing um, uh, for doing statistics and, and higher math. Um, it's a language that you'll hear about, but Python is actually dominant in the space right now. Uh, somebody's saying, uh, sounds like a diesel engine, slow and strong. Yeah, um, that's that's not a bad analogy. Um, it's kind of like Python is, uh, you know, it's gonna it's gonna be reliable. It's just gonna work, and um, it's strong, but it might be a little bit slow. <laughs> might be just a little bit slow to rev up sometimes, but it definitely has its strengths. Okay, cool. Um, Replit, we talked about Replit. Anybody want to hear more about Replit? Well, I think we talked about it. Uh, Tovio covered this. Uh, I guess I will reiterate this. Um, I, we do recommend that you, you'll see links to like install like Anaconda and VS Code and uh, other things. Um, and get up and running. Ultimately, when you get into the DSI, we're going to need you on 
VS Code. So you want to kind of start envir local environment set up uh, as soon as possible, especially if you've never done it before. Um, it can be kind of an intimidating process. It might not be something that you just set up in a day. It might take you uh, a few days or a week of kind of tinkering with it to be comfortable and learning uh, how to use your local environment using VS Code, in other words. Um, for that time, start by using Replit. Um, it might not feel as satisfying, but it's a tool that's actually very, at least it feels very similar. Uh, any, any like shortcut or like hotkey operation that you learn in, in um, Replit is gonna work in VS Code. So there's, it, they're meant to feel kind of similar and be pretty compatible. So uh, Replit's a, a great beginner tool. It's not to be underestimated. Um, I'm just looking through here. Okay. So we have a few links to uh, documentation, uh, the Python documentation, uh, Pep8 style guide. I'm actually going to just paste in these links. Let me find it. I have to get it in here, actually. Excuse me. Oops. And we'll go up to here. OK, that's not going to do it. So. We're just pasting these into Slack real quick. Um, I know Tovio touched on these, so uh, I don't want to go too much in, in depth with this, but I'll, I'll just talk about each one really quickly. Um, so the Python documentation is the official documentation for Python. This is a resource that I I didn't really find useful until I was um, fair, pretty proficient in as a programmer and uh, in the language. Um, I recommend just go take a look at, at it. Um, don't 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 feel bad if it doesn't make a lot of sense or if it's not that accessible. Um, it's something you'll learn to, learning to read documentation is a bit of an art. It's a bit of a science. Um, it'll just, it's something that just kind of comes with time. And we'll kind of talk about that as we go. I'll, I'll kind of talk about some, some things related to that. Um, what I do recommend you spend some time looking at is the PEP8 style guide. So what a style guide is, this is sort of the um, official or canonical style guide for, uh, for Python. And actually, you know, I think this is actually worth presenting a little bit. So this is something when I learned about style guides um, when I was first learning to program. Let me just pull up my browser here. When I learned about style guides, I was kind of at first um, I didn't really get the point. And then once I got the point, I was like, oh, this is really, really useful. So let me just present this really quick. Let me see if I can find. OK. So this is uh, the PEP8 website, uh, style guide for Python code. So we'll just kind of look through here. So what this is, is a, a guide to help you standardize your coding style. And the goal of this is not 
really to make your code look exactly like my code or everyone else's code. Python's, I think, pretty nice in that the general structure of one person's code and another person's code, if they approached a problem in a similar way, will really look similar. So that really aids in readability. It means if, if two people approach a problem, solving a problem in a similar way, they're gonna have code that looks the same aesthetically, just kind of naturally because of the rules of, of, the, of the Python language. Uh, and, and PEP8 or a style guide um, will help you with that. So you can see, you can look through here. This is talking about how to, um, how do you code layout? Uh, or this is talking about indentation, right? So you can see here's a correct example and here's an incorrect example. Uh, and we'll get into you know what it, what role indentation plays kind of as we go. But um, it's kind of cool to just kind of look through here every now and again, especially as you learn, because sometimes they'll talk about standardizing something in a way that you didn't think about standardizing it. And that can be nice because if you have a standard way of doing things, it makes thinking about and reasoning about your code just simpler because you're not thinking, how do I format this? Where do I put this? What should I do with that? It's just like there's a canonical standard way of doing things. And um, you don't have to, and as you'll see, uh, I, don't, I don't do everything uh, that Pepe says there's some there's some um, things that I prefer to do that are uh, not or that are different from what Pepe specifies. Um, but I have I have reasons for the way I prefer things, and I do them that way every time. So it's it's not about like that you have to do things exactly the way that Pepe does them. It's about that's a good reference for how you can develop your own coding style. And when you develop a, a strong style, it just makes it easier to code because there's like a lot of easy assumptions that you can make. You know, I know I always do this in this particular way. And if there's a reason that you deviate from PEP8, just make sure that you have a reason, you know, just have a, have a, a reason to justify a deviation. And it can just be, you know, because I like the way it looks <laughs> or it helps me read it. You know, I find this easier to read, you know, uh, that's a totally acceptable reason. Okay, cool. Um, so definitely spend some time on Pep8. Um, I didn't show Code Wars, but Code Wars is a good place. Uh, there's a lot of, of good coding practice sites. Um, Tovio and I have both used Code Wars extensively. That's what we're both familiar with. Um, so that's what we recommend. Just it's a it's a good place to start and to just like find a bunch of random problems. So when you want to just do general practice and find problems to work on, um, Code Wars is a good good spot. Okay, cool. Uh, text editors. Well, I talked a little bit about this editor. Um, this is a pretty standard uh, look for an editor. Um, you know, not necessarily the colors, but, you know, um, you can see on the left, I have just a text file. Down here, I have a terminal. If you're not familiar with what a terminal is, we'll kind of be learning that as a little bit as we go. Um, and then over here, I have just another sort of uh, uh, window pane to uh, present uh, rendered markdown. And so... Um, all of these features, everything you see here and everything that I'm going to use this with uh, is going to be pretty directly analogous to something that you can do in Replit or VS Code or another text editor. Um, and I'm sorry, it looks like we have some questions here. Ah, okay. No, never mind. Um, looks like everybody's good. Um, so how to program. We're going to learn all of how to program 
right now, kind of. Uh, so <laughs> step one, think about the problem. Step two, define what it means for the for the program to be working. I like, I like to say, define, define what it means for the problem to be solved uh, or what a working solution, what you want to end up with. Um, create a series of formal steps that lead to a repeatable operation. So an example of this would be, let's say you're in a different city, you're staying at a hotel or an Airbnb or something, and um, you want to go... Uh, you want to go find a grocery store. Uh, unless you know that area, if your goal is to go find a grocery store, we're in the think about the problem phase. So how would I go about finding a grocery store and, and getting to that grocery store? So I, I have a few strategies that I could employ to locate it. I could look it up on my phone or a computer. If I don't have access to those things or don't want to use those things, you know, maybe if I'm in New York, maybe I could walk out of wherever I'm staying and ask somebody and say like, hey, do you know where there's a store where I can buy a sandwich or something uh, or get some groceries around here? So you maybe could ask somebody and they could give you directions. Um, so defining what it means for going to the grocery store successfully is analogous to like having a list like what what is what is a successful grocery store run look like um you know you want to get like bananas and cereal and um um i don't know uh goat cheese and baked beans or something like that um you have a list of things that you need to come back with and if you don't you know, and your intent is to come back with as many of those things as possible, or at least, subs, you know, acceptable substitutions for those things where, where possible. Um, so that's something like defining what it means for a, a problem to be solved, right? Um, and then creating a series of formal steps that lead to a repeatable operation. So you might look up a, a route to drive or to walk. Um, one thing I kind of add to this is you might sketch out a route and look at a map if you think about like a route on Google Maps or something from where you're at to the grocery store. Um, there'll be some turns, but maybe when you plot it out or when, you know, if you used a map mapping service, when the mapping service plotted out the, the route, maybe it didn't anticipate that there was a road closure or um, construction work, but that's kind of okay. Um, if you encounter something like that, you can find a workaround. So this step is still worth doing, right? It's still worth approximating, well, here's something that would get me there. There's no guarantee that that route will get you there, but if it doesn't, it at least gets you close to a route that will get you there, right? So there's still a way there. You might have to go around something that you didn't anticipate. So um, that's a there's sort of a, a problem solving uh, axiom that I uh, that I notice and, and want to mention there. Cool. Um, all right, so we've got a little bit of a breakout. Uh, so write an algorithm for boiling a box of spaghetti. So I'll give you an example and, and I'll show you what I want you to do in Slack. You're gonna put your answer in Slack here. Um, so I'll give you an example with the going to the grocery store. Um, so, or what would be, yeah. Uh, so I'll just do a bulleted list here. I'll say, um, look up directions. Uh, Pay for the items and um, cool. So this might be one way uh, 
that I would write an answer to how to go to the grocery store, an algorithm for going to the grocery store and coming back and getting groceries, right? So this is not exhaustive. Obviously, we could get this is really high level. This isn't super granular, right? Like I didn't describe the process of like picking out a cart and maneuvering the cart through the doors and uh, an algorithm for choosing the row where each item is on your, or uh, a lane or, or what do they call it? Uh, an aisle where each item is on your, on your list. And then an algorithm for finding the item on the on each shelf, right? You know, you could get that detailed, but obviously we have limited time, so that's what I'm doing. Um, cool. So um, you don't have to put your your things in a bulleted list like this. By the way, you don't have to put them on on different lines. You can just put them on uh, in one line and just separate each item, each step with a comma or do something like um, a, oops, something like an arrow, like step one, step two, something like that, um, something like that. Okay, so define an algorithm for boiling a box of spaghetti, uh, define the steps clearly and an operation, and, and at an appropriate level uh, for an extraterrestrial with good human language skills who has never cooked pasta before. There is no single correct solution here. So I'm going to put, I know this says five minutes, but we've done about a minute. I'm going to put four minutes on the clock and uh, go ahead and put your answers for this algorithm, put them in the, uh, in the thread in Slack. Okay, cool. We'll wrap up there. Um, some funny ones in here. I'm just kind of reading through here. Great. Uh, feel free to, to finish yours if you're not done yet. Uh, feel free to finish up and put it in there or just put in whatever you've got at this point. And um, <clears throat> we're going to move on. I'm actually going to start talking about uh, some Python features. So um, for this one, if you don't have your Replit open or your environment, whatever environment that you use, um, open, uh, go ahead and open up a Replit or your environment. Um, so for this one, we're going to talk about comments. Now, you, you, you're going to see that I have all these, all this stuff in this text file. And this is a Python file. I've got all these hashes and quotes and little comments and stuff. So this is, um, you can kind of ignore all this for the time being. We'll just kind of come down here um, somewhere where it's empty. So uh, all these right now, everything in here is various comments. And the reason I have this bunch of hashes is this doesn't really do anything other than just act as a visual separator for me to like kind of make different sections of the code. So um, a comment is just a way of writing a message that just stays in our code. And it's just, it's like a, a, a footnote or a note in the margins um, that's just there. It's not Python, the Python interpreter doesn't regard it as actual code to be executed. It's useful as a way of leaving messages usually to ourselves. Um, I, I write a lot of code that only I am ever going to read. And I don't have a, a ton of comments, but occasionally I'll, I'll put in some comments um, a line of com uh, a line or two of comments to remind myself why I chose to do something a certain way in case it's maybe not the way that I would have normally done that thing. Or um, if I'm learning a new technique or learning a new tool or a new library or something, uh, I might take in a uh, make a couple comments to, to remind myself how something works or why I did something that way. Um, or I might 
like leave myself a funny joke um, just because I like to do that. But um, yeah. So a comment, there are two types of comments. There's single line comments. So this is a comment. And as soon as I go to another line, this is no longer a comment. So Python thinks that it's supposed to, to treat this like code and it actually doesn't really know what to do with it because it's not valid Python code. If I run this, I'm gonna get a syntax error and it's like, I, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what to do with that. So, um, but I can comment it out and then it's back to being normal. So there's a shortcut key. You're gonna see me with my cursor in like the middle of the line um, and just comment things out, turn lines of code on and off um, really quickly. And that's another useful thing or another way that comments are useful is if you wrote a line of code that you don't wanna delete, but you wanna kind of set aside, you don't want it to run when you run your code for whatever reason, you can just comment it out. So there's a, there's a shortcut key um, for Linux or Windows, it's gonna be control forward slash. Uh, for Mac, it'll be command forward slash. The forward slash key is the one with the question mark on it. So, um, and depending on your platform, it will, it will be that for uh, Replit, VS Code, and, and most modern standard text editors will use that shortcut to just quickly ter uh, comment a line out or uncomment it. So that's a single line comment. Uh, the next kind of comment is a multi-line comment. So there's two ways to make a multi-line comment. So these are these are single tick quote characters. So I can use three single tick quote characters, two pairs of triple single tick quotes. It's kind of a lot of numbers there. Uh, or I can use two pairs of triple double tick quotes. Right, so these are three single tick quotes. So this tells me that this is the beginning of the multi-line comment. And then when it encounters another three single tick quotes, it will end that multi-line comment. So I could say, this is a multi-line comment. Um, just to allay any confusion about this, there is literally zero difference between using triple double tick quotes or triple single tick quotes for a multi-line comment. It's not, when I was first learning and I've had people ask me this um, and think like, oh, well maybe one is slightly different than the other. Maybe there's a reason to use one here and a reason to use another there. Uh, they do exactly the same thing. It's just two different ways to do the exact same thing. So you can use, single ticks like this or double ticks like this, same, same thing. Um, so I do something kind of fancy with these, which is I make these little comment blocks, these little switches. And I'm not gonna go into how these work, but if I comment out this top line, uh, print, I'm just gonna write a couple lines of code, hello. Uh, if I comment out this top line, it activates the code inside of it. Whereas if I uncomment the top line, it turns this whole thing into a multi-line comment, which means this whole block of code is uncommented. Um, you can play around with these if you want. I use them all the time, just so you know what I'm doing. You don't have to know them. It, I'm, I think, literally the only person I know who uses these kind of comment switches like this. Um, I find it useful for teaching because I can kind of explore a concept and then I don't have to delete the code. I can just comment out a, a number of lines really quickly and easily. And then if I want to come back to it, if somebody's like, hey, would you go back to that thing? I can go back and explore it. That's pretty quick and easy. So. Um, yeah, so that's comments in a nutshell. Um, we are unfortunately out of time. I'm gonna pick up here. We're gonna start uh, next time by talking about comments and some reasons we might wanna use comments. Um, of course, you can just read through here 
and um, we'll we'll cover that explicitly in uh, the next class as well. Cool. So let me wrap up there. I think Tobio is back on with us. Let's see. Um, yeah, I don't see Tovio just yet, but um, we can we can wrap up here. Um, I know some folks are on the East Coast and it's just kind of getting late in general. So um, uh, if you're done for the night, then have a good rest of your night. If you want to stay on and ask questions, we're going to open up for questions. Oh, and, and there's Tovio. Uh, they just got back. So um, we're going to stay on and uh, ask questions. So feel free uh, to hang out for that as well. Cool. Thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>